so uh, dear dear audience i uh, um, there was a technical issue uh, i read the chat just now there were people uh, commenting there were no audio and nothing i think uh, there were some technical issues uh, sorry about that um, i was about to play an a, a audio clip a video clip on l time so let me uh, play that we'll start again Uh, thank you, uh, participants, for watching the Chrome clip of Elta. Uh, before we move on to the session, I have a few announcements uh, to the participant in terms of handling the chat and your certificates. Uh, so, in course of the session, you have the chat facility where you can ask your questions, and if you have any ideas uh, in terms of the topic, uh, you can share uh, on the chat. Uh, and I request audience to not to share your personal phone numbers or email IDs on the chat. Uh, in the last ten minutes of the presentation, I'll post the feedback link. On the chat, so keep track of the chat. So it will get the link. Once you fill in the feedback link, your certificate will reach you automatically. So uh, if you have any problem in terms of accessing your certificate, you can write to us uh, and we'll uh, look into it. So with this, uh, I hand over the session to the moderator of this day. Uh, we have Mr. Lawrence Raj Anthony. He's an assistant professor of English, uh, CVR College of Engineering, Autonomous Hyderabad. He is also the executive secretary of Eltai Hyderabad South chapter. Uh, sir, over to you, sir.
So you may you may start now, sir. Right. Uh, very good evening to everyone. Let me introduce to you today's uh, speaker uh, for uh, Eltai webinar, 89th Eltai webinar. Dr. Jay Raju Salvendra is a professor in the Department of Phonetics and spoken English of prestigious university, EFL University, formerly known as Seful Hyderabad. He is the Dean School of Language Sciences. He is a former director non-formal courses and resources wing of university and also the former head department of phonetics and spoken English, IFLO Hyderabad. Professor Salivendra has an MA in English from NU and a PGDT postgraduate diploma in the teaching of English, an MPhil and PhD in English, phonetics and linguistics from CIFL. His specializations include English accent training, intelligibility studies of English, grammar and usage, and applied phonetics. He has got 26 years of professional experience enriched with teaching English in rural, to rural, urban, metropolitan, and international students. His experience includes seven years of teaching English in Sirth, University Sirth, Libya. When he was working in Libya, he was on the team of British Council's teachers trainers who oriented the Libyan teachers of English on certain essential issues of English language teaching. He has authored five books on English pronunciation and published some research papers in the area of English phonetics and linguistics. Over to you, sir. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Lawrence, for such a warm introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to interact with uh, LTI teaching fraternity. Indeed, uh, it's an honor for me to be with you all. Uh, ruminating on the topic approaching spoken English. Yeah, uh, let me uh, take off on this compendious talk. I formally welcome you all to this uh, talk on approaching spoken English, a phonetician's rumination. <clears throat> Well, when it comes to spoken English, one of the basic concerns, uh, you know, is mutual intelligibility. This afternoon, I would like to, uh, you know, uh, uh, I would like to speak to you all on four different aspects. One is uh, intelligibility. The second one is uh, some, you know, I would like to, you know, uh, let me, let me uh, uh, tell you that, you know, my talk is divided into four parts. And the first part deals with intelligibility and intelligibility related issues with specific reference to spoken English. The second one, you know, the second part, I'd like to bring a couple of case studies. And in the third part, I would like to mention certain essentials of spoken English. And in the fourth part, maybe we can uh, see uh, uh, the summary of this talk. Right, you know, when we talk about intelligibility in the Indian tradition of phonetics, we can take a Paninian uh, a concern here. Panini, uh, you know, Panini was actually, you know, uh, uh, in his contemporary uh, days, 
times sanskrit grammar was taught orally and uh, there were it was reported that there were seven to eight sanskrit grammarians and they used to teach sanskrit grammar orally and it was also the time sanskrit was spreading into different parts of the uh, you know subcontinent india <clears throat> And wherever it goes, there was a variety of Sanskrit. As we have, you know, uh, different varieties of English today, there used to be uh, uh, different varieties of Sanskrit. And this invited Paninian's attention and he reflected upon the issue and uh, uh, then he proposed, uh, no, uh, he started attempting, you know, uh, Ashtadhyayi, you know, he started writing Ashtadhyayi to, you know, in the process of standardizing Sanskrit. So uh, in his Siksha, Paninian Siksha, you know, he has come up with, uh, he came up with certain uh, uh, deliberations and uh, he, exp he expressed his concern in a very systematic manner. Let me, uh, let me uh, show the concerns here. Uh, Paninian Siksha, uh, the couplet, 52 uh, uh, couplet, 52 couplet, there are nearly 60 couplets in Paninian Siksha. This is uh, the 50 second couplet and in this couplet he expresses his concern a mantra uttered either with a defective account or pronunciation is badly done and it does not carry the proper sense and it is like a thunderbolt of speech and kills the uh ignamana just as indra uh, uh, Indra Shatru did on account of its wrong accent. You know, uh, uh, there are you know Sanskrit words here, uh, and we can understand his concern in this uh, uh, translation of the couplet. So a defective accent or pronunciation is badly done, and it is it does not carry the proper sense. That was his concern. Accent and pronunciation are emphasized, you know, here in this loka. Now, uh, the, uh, there is another, uh, uh, another couplet. Let me draw your attention to that also. When a mantra is deficient in a syllable, it tends to diminish life. And when it is lacking in proper accent, it makes the reciter trouble with illness and the syllable wrongly treated will strike one at the head as a thunderbolt. Of course, you know, that you can see there are certain uh, 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 religious beliefs, but if you disassociate the religious beliefs, Panini has a clear linguistic concern that is you know uh, uh, the articulation the accent and pronunciation must be clear for effective communication and uh, you know even you know he mentions a lot of things with regard to pronunciation and accent you know a sound distortion he mentions that you know a sound distortion brings about change in the meaning you know, Arabs, uh, Arabs, uh, you know, do not have uh, pa in their language, and so they replace it with ba. And one of the sentences given to them is, uh, uh, "Set this, uh, give me your ban, please. Beta, give me your ban, please. Beta, Peter, give me your ban, please." I gave them another sentence and they said, Pastor, please pray for me. Uh, the sentence was, Pastor, please pray for me. 
They said, Buster, please pray for me. So one sound change brings about change in the meaning. I was interacting with an Australian when I was abroad. And uh, I, you know, in a context, I asked him, when did uh, he arrive? Uh, then in response to my question, he said, oh, well, uh, I came to die. So I, I was joking with him, you know, uh, John, you need not to travel. He is an Australian. You need not to travel all the way to Libya from Australia to die here. So one sound change brings about change in the meaning. That was the concern here. Panini expressed, you know, uh, uh, the you know the importance. You know, he uh, uh, he he wrote a lot on the importance of accent and pronunciation, particularly with specific reference to syllable. And when it comes to, uh, you know, the modern research, Smith and Nelson proposed the three category system, intelligibility, comprehensibility, and interpretability. When it comes to intelligibility, is it is defined this way, recognition of rhythm, intonation, and form. And comprehensibility refers to recognition of meaning. Interpretability is referred to understanding the intent of meaning. You know, see, for example, if I, you know, uh, 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 say something like uh, uh, you know, that, that may not be intelligible to people because the sound system is not familiar to the ear, the perceptual uh, uh, organ. <clears throat> so uh, people may not respond on this group. People on this group may not respond to my kaka bohaha. But if I use the code which is familiar or common to all of us, you will certainly respond. So this kaka bohaha is not intelligible to uh, the ear. Hence, the comprehensibility is affected. The recognition of meaning is affected. And it was not recognized. The meaning was properly, the, the meaning was uh, uh, not properly recognized. People do not understand the meaning and message of the utterance. And then they may not respond to what I said in Kaha Bokaha. So they have interconnection. And there is also a hierarchy in the entire communication process. Intelligibility, if there is no intelligibility, there is no comprehensibility. Otherwise, if uh, the speech is not intelligible, uh, the speech cannot be comprehended. If the speech is not intelligible and comprehended, it cannot be interpreted by the receiver. Hence, in any spoken system or in any uh, spoken language, these three uh, issues need to be respected. And while you know teaching and uh, teaching or, or planning teaching spoken English or spoken languages mm -hmm. for that matter. So, uh, and when it comes to uh, intelligibility, there is another important aspect called mutual intelligibility. And when the code is not mutually intelligible, the linguistic code is not mutually intelligible, there won't be any communication. In fact, Mutual intelligibility is the basic criteria for defining languages. For instance, if you want to define uh, this kaha bokaha language as a linguistic code, there must be at least a community, a small community, which uses uh, uh, this linguistic code for their communication within the community. And the linguistic code is mutually intelligible, then 
it can be considered to be a language. Otherwise, you know, if there is no community where this linguistic code is mutually intelligible, uh, the code, the linguistic code, kakabokaka, cannot be considered to be a language. It cannot be defined as a language. The second important issue with regard to mutual intelligibility is mutual responsibility for effective. Mutual intelligibility is uh, mutual responsibility for effective communication. Uh, you know, actually, when I was uh, presenting a paper at uh, Harvard on mutual intelligibility, one of the proposals I made was this. Even the native speakers of English, the native speakers of English, should learn English again for global purposes. That was one of the uh, proposals uh, I made in that, uh, through that paper. The native speakers of English should learn English again for global purposes. I called, you know, uh, Terry and uh, he raised a question. Well, how can you ask an American to learn his own language? That was his question. I said, you know, I, I ask, you know, I ask the Americans and British, the native speakers of English again and again, for learning English again and again for global purposes. For these reasons, I have given them uh, uh, 15 to 16 linguistic reasons, and I will illust illustrate a couple of uh, the linguistic reasons why they should learn English again for global purposes. In American English, there is a, a lot of roticity. The American accent is known for roticity. It is a rotic accent. That rotic effect is seen, you know, is perceived in American English. Another, uh, you know, popular uh, or dominant feature is nasality. 70 to uh, 80 percent of the people nasalize their speech. Nasality is very dominant in American English. I always illustrate this with a, a sentence, you know, uh, a, 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 a test material sentence. That is, for example, if we take up a sentence like this, uh, the doctor is in the operation theater. Uh, a British guy comes up and says, the doctor is in the operation theater. If you give the same utterance to sentence to a British, an American guy, he says, first he roticizes uh, uh, the entire utterance. The doctor is in the operation theater. The doctor is in the operation theater. And uh, he will add nasality. Then the doctor is in the operation theater. When I, you know, collected my data, with regard to intelligibility, the Americans are not intelligible to the majority of the world's population, particularly with specific, uh, it's my generalization, but within my subjects, you know, they were not highly intelligible. Because the speech was nasalized, and the speech was roticized, and there are other uh, uh, morphophonological issues with the married English. So then I said, you Americans need to reduce roticity. And reduce nasality. Is it possible? They were asking me, certain questions. I said in speech therapy, they are possible. In India, we have been, you know, uh, spending a lot of money on setting up English language laboratories to reduce mother tongue influence of, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
the Indian learners English. So we spend the laboratories. Why? Because when we go global, we want to be intelligible to the community. And the Americans and British, they can't speak English. Hello. Yes, sir, your audible is gone, sir. Sorry, you know, I, yeah. Uh, Americans and British, they can't speak English as they speak at their home. There's a variety called domestic variety of English. They can't use the domestic variety of English. They have to come out of it. When they come global, they should make themselves intelligible. In my research, when Americans and Indians are talking to each other, the mutual intelligibility was only 6%. I'm not talking about one-way intelligibility. You know, Americans are more intelligible, you know, uh, to the uh, Indians because we always, you know, follow American English or British English. We are familiar with the variety. So Americans are intelligible to British, but uh, Americans are intelligible to the Indians, but the Indians are not intelligible to uh, the Americans and mutual intelligibility, you know, uh, mutual, you know, we, we you know, mute, that's where I said mutual intelligibility is a mutual responsibility. When we try to go global, we have to approximate to the variety which is intelligible to the global community. When we are in India, we can use Indian variety of English, but when we go global, yes, we can approximate. This is what Kachru calls it, you know, the, uh, uh, with regard to this, Kachru clearly mentions that uh, humans exercise uh, the ability, you know, the innate ability called linguistic approximation. We approximate our language to the context situation, you know. Uh, I, there are other factors to which we approximate our accent. So uh, that is where, you know, uh, mutual intelligibility, you know, Americans, you know, said, you know, when uh, uh, British, you know, see, uh, when I was talking about roticity and uh, 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 nasality and other morphophonological issues that make American accent uh, uh, less intelligible, uh, then they said it is not our problem. If they don't understand us, it is not our problem. You know, uh, I can't, you know, when I'm speaking to this community here, I cannot speak in the way I like to speak and, you know, uh, uh, leave the audience to their fate and say, if you understand, understand, otherwise leave it. You know, as a speaker, the minimum irreducible responsibility I have got is to make myself intelligible to my audience. Even the Americans, when they speak, you know, it is their minimum responsibility to make themselves intelligible. As Indians, when we go global, when we speak to the global community, it is, our, it is my responsibility, it is our responsibility to make myself intelligible to others. For that purpose, we spend a lot of money on the English language education. And uh, similarly, Americans should also spend a lot of money Accent reduction. Technically, we call it accent reduction. So, as non native speakers of English, we uh, uh, undergo a kind of accent neutralization. 
And as the native speakers of English, Americans, Australians, or British, they will undergo a kind of accent redu reduction. So accent reduction and accent neutralization need to be paid attention when we try to promote mutual intelligibility of English. So uh, that's where I said mutual intelligibility is a mutual responsibility for effective communication. And thirdly, mutual intelligibility is non-negotiable for anyone to be successful in communication. So I would like to give you uh, two utterances here. Two utterances. Uh, I think you know I can interact with uh, uh, some of the participants here. So the, uh, they can they can answer on the chat, sir. Maybe you can ask your questions. They can answer on uh, the chat, uh, but they can't uh, speak to me, right? No, no, that's not possible, sir. Yeah. So you can you can speak to me, uh, Mr. Sam. <laughs> yes, sir. Tell me, sir. <laughs> <laughs> let us let us let us uh, do a small activity. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, we are talking about non-negotiable issues related to pronunciation, okay? Mm. And uh, 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 I'll, I'll call you back when I come to uh, that particular activity. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, you know, sounds, you know, that is where, you know, uh, for example, uh, uh, let me... Uh, let me draw your attention on the sounds. One sound brings about change in the meaning. And similarly, uh, there is, as Panini mentioned, accent and pronunciation, they are also very important for successful communication, uh, particularly uh, with regard to mutual intelligibility. Right, uh, let me uh, uh, request Sam to come back. Yes, sir. Tell me. Uh, Sam, uh, you know, I'll give you two models. Mm -hmm. One, uh, I have tested this uh, in a lot of uh, uh, conferences uh, and uh, gatherings. Let me test here also. I'll give you two utterances. You have to choose one of your choice, okay? Okay. The first one, my brother from America. Two. Uh, my brother is uh, yani coming from uh, America. Which one do you prefer? Hmm. <laughs> For the sake of understanding, I would prefer the second. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I'll, 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 I'll give you, uh, I'll simplify it. Uh, I'll come okay. back uh, to the Indian way. Uh, uh, my brother from America. The second one, my brother is coming from America. Which yeah. one do you prefer? I prefer the second one, sir. <laughs> second one. Perfectly yeah. all right. I appreciate it. So now I have a shocking question. <laughs> <laughs> See, for example, uh, if you have kids, okay, uh -huh. if you want your kids to speak English, which mm -hmm. way? The first way or the second way? <laughs> Be honest. Yeah, sure. Um... So initially they'll start with the first, so that they they make. I mean, uh, they they sound intelligible uh, to the listener. Okay. Maybe uh, no, in uh, course of time Sam, uh, they'll <laughs> shift to the first to be, one. <laughs> to be brief, to yeah. be brief, one or two. Uh, yeah. You know, which 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 one do you prefer for your kids? Mm. The first or the second? The first one, my brother from America. The second one, my brother is coming from America. <laughs> the first one probably, sir. Yes, first one. I do understand. You know, mm. uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, I really appreciate your uh, uh, preference. Thank you. Sir. This is what uh, I know uh, people prefer. When I, you know, majority of the people, ninety-five percent of the people prefer the first one. When I come back uh, with the second question, do you know why? 
let us go back. Let us let us proceed. Hello, uh, I have some problem with the not to. Yeah, yeah. Is it the slide you want, sir, on the screen? Yeah, this is the one. Right. Yeah. See, when we uh, uh, see, if you look at the first one, my brother come America is grammatically horrible. But the second one, my brother is coming from America is grammatically sound. But the people, when uh, the second question is posed, take completely U-turn and come to the first one. What matters there? It is grammatically horrible. Yet people prefer it. That is what Panini mentions. Accent, it sounds English, right? That is what I always call languageness. Every language has got its own quality. And when it comes to grammatical uh, or grammaticality, grammatical information, even in our mother tongue, Record your, uh, you know, conversations, telephonic conversations that take place in your mother tongue for about a month. And afterwards, go back to the conversations, recorded conversations, one after the other, and try to pick up the grammatical uh, uh, features of your utterances that you have used. You will find in almost you know, in almost every sentence, you will find uh, 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 something, you know, something or the other uh, erroneous in grammaticality. So, what do we understand here? Grammatical aspects, grammar and grammatical issues are negotiable in spoken languages. But accentual issues are not negotiable. They are non-negotiable. That is that languageness. My brother from America, an American can understand, or a non-native speaker of English. You know, see, I have uh, intelligibility scores. If possible, I'll show you that score. Uh, but basically, what we need to understand is, uh, 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 you know, this accent matters a lot in the, uh, in the sense of languageness. languageness. Languageness matters a lot for the ear. So it sounds English. That's why people prefer it. But grammatical issues, when it comes to grammatical issues, they are negotiable. But Accent and pronunciation are non-negotiable. And if one maintains the languageness, the language can be intelligible. Once it is intelligible, people can negotiate with grammatical uh, uh, mistakes cognitively. So that's why mutual intelligibility is very, very you know, uh, significant with regard to accent and pronunciation. Accents and, uh, you know, when we say accent, there are uh, a lot of other features, uh, melody patterns and other things, uh, tones and uh, accent, you know, word stress and other things, all, all the other uh, uh, phonetic features come into picture uh, uh, that promote the languageness of spoken varieties. Now, I'll give you two uh, uh, case studies. And afterwards, we will do uh, maybe uh, Sam and I will do an activity here. So, you know, there are 10 Bihari speakers who migrated from Bihar to Amaravati, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, and 
they started you know uh, they are you know skilled laborers they migrated from bihar to andhra pradesh and uh, they stay in vijayawada so two years ago i met them when i met it was already uh, six to seven months time they came to vijayawada and they were speaking wonderful telugu that to vijayawada dialect coastal dialect of telugu i uh, chose 10 people and i recorded these uh, speech samples i gave them you know uh, uh, topics like uh, how do they like vijayawada and uh, uh, and uh, let them introduce themselves uh, uh, you know uh, and uh, uh, what is the food they like here in vijayawada things like that and they spoke on those topics i recorded their speech samples and then i took these speech samples to uh, the native telugu speakers and where i have collected speech samples of native telugu speakers also another 10 i mixed up all of them and then i played these clips to the native speakers of english uh, native speakers of telugu and uh, i got the data and one of the questions feedback questions was just this they have to mention whether the speaker uh, in the audio file is a native telugu speaker or non native telugu speaker and uh, you know these 10 biharis seven speakers out of these 10 biharis were identified as native telugu speakers native speakers of telugu out of 10 seven speakers or uh, you know bihari speakers of telugu were identified as the telugu speakers the native telugu speakers that was really uh, shocking to me and then i have you know when i was in libya when i was working in libya i collected uh, you know i did a similar kind of data collection with the indian learners of libyan arabic right so and i collected nearly 25 uh, speech samples of indian learners of libyan arabic and out of these 25 nearly 16 guys were identified as native libyan arabic speakers by native you know uh, libyan arabic speakers so what is that you know and this happens you know this happens they picked up uh, this telugu the bihari learners picked up telugu within six to seven months and they can impress, they could impress the native speakers of Telugu. And uh, the Indian learners of Libyan Arabic, within eight to nine months' time, they could speak Libyan Arabic in the way Libyans, you know, speak. And they could impress, you know, upon uh, their, you know, uh, you know, they can impress the native speakers of Libyan Arabic, and they they couldn't identify them that they are Indians. They identified these sixteen learners of Arabic, Indian learners of Arabic, as the locals. So, what is you know what is what is the strategy they follow? What is the strategy they follow? How could they pick up the spoken variety of Arabic? or the spoken variety of Telugu very fast, within six to seven months. Now, I would like to request uh, uh, Sam to come back. We will do an activity. Yes, sir. Thank you. And then we, we will uh, take some, you know, uh, take up some issues after the, after the activity, okay? Uh, Sam, now, uh, yes, I'm sorry for bothering you again and again. Hey, but, come uh, on, come on. <laughs> let us do an activity. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So, 
you know uh, i'm going to say something you have to repeat it exactly oh <laughs> yeah i'll try yeah yeah uh maybe you can switch on your video no problem i don't mind <laughs> it's okay sir <laughs> right right so you have to repeat as i say exactly what i say okay yeah tikadis repeat sir yeah tikadis yeah tikanis yeah tikanis very good imekala 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 yeah tikanis imekala yeah tikanis imekala if karisto if karisto if karisto if karisto if karisto kesi kesi if karisto kesi if karisto kesi imekala if karisto kesi imekala if karisto kesi right i think uh, you are you you remember the expressions right <laughs> yeah i'm trying to <laughs> right right uh, then imekala if karisto imekara if karisto imekala imekala if karisto imekala imekala if karisto right ya yeah, tikanis ya yeah, tikanis imekala if karisto imekala if karisto imekala if karisto if karisto imekala if karisto kesi kesi imekala imekala if karisto if karisto right right you know you know what language is this i don't know sir Ar Ar arabic is it i, I don't know you guessing. know what language this is yeah uh, you know this is greek greek oh okay yeah. so i am just you know giving you yeah yeah means hello oh hello yeah and then tikanis means how are you oh how are you mm. then imekala i'm fine if karisto thank you kesi and you okay uh, and the other guy responds this way imekala if karisto i'm fine thank you this is greeting one another okay a very casual greeting kind mm. of stuff right so i'll i'll ask you questions you respond <laughs> now <laughs> you, you. <laughs> okay mm. yeah so uh let us begin uh yeah sam tikanis <laughs> sorry sir, i don't understand <laughs> maybe i can uh, repeat i was ready for yeah. answering a question right right perfectly all right mm. so yeah sam tikanis i'm asking you hello sam how are you yeah, yeah sam tikanis and the answer is imekala uh, yes very imekala uh, imekala uh, imekala fine yeah. imekala if karisto thank you if karisto thank you and you, you should ask about me also right you should written <laughs> I, i didn't write that's a problem <laughs> yeah no 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 problem no problem Ime, imekala if karisto imekala if karisto kesi so in makara if karisto kesi i mean i'm uh, fine thank you how are you right? yeah in makala in makala in makala in makala if karisto ah uh, thank you so shall we start again uh, yes sir. yeah sam tikanis um in makara if karisto sam sam i'm i'm it means i'm fine right i'm fine thank you yes Go yes, ahead. Go ahead. Don't. Ah, yes. Ah, uh, yes, imakala if karisto. Imakala if karisto. You know, uh, uh, let us. You ask me the question. Ah. Kesi. Ah, if ka. Ah, imakala if karisto. Right. I say. I, I so say. So you can. 
yeah, yeah you can you can begin you can simply say yeah uh jera uh, uh, you can say that <laughs> okay yeah sir the canis yeah the, uh in the car the car is too yes ah in the car the car is too very good if we repeat a couple of times thank you sir thank you very much if we repeat a couple of times i think you know uh, uh we will certainly because sam is not prepared for this that's why uh, it took uh, some time otherwise you know uh, he might have picked up very fast you know he picked up picked it up and uh, uh you know if we repeat it a couple of times i think uh, we can interact in greek using these expressions so when i was evaluating and uh, looking uh, analyzing the data and evaluating the strategies what i understood is the basic unit was actuants they see uh, when they were picking up arabic the indian learners of arabic uh, when they when the indians who were picking up arabic they their basic unit was actuants when bihari learners of telugu were picking up telugu their basic unit was actuants their basic focus was actuants what is an actuants actuants is basically spoken it's a meaningful noise in a context uh, and we have basic differences between sentence and utterance so uh, i'm not going into those details but utterance is very very important and they picked up each and every utterance the context the context sorry when 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 they bank on utterance utterance in on each and every utterance they were reflecting upon the context they were picking up the utterance from the context and with a purpose so utterances need to be paid attention even though you know uh, 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 they are long or short whatever it may be you know they were paying attention on the context and the purpose of each and every utterance atuns again you know when we are looking at uh, this greek conversation uh, he doesn't know word boundaries even uh, sam doesn't know the word boundaries but he was following the syllables and the melody pattern and the third one is the meaning and message of each and every atuns this is the atuns grammar this is the, this was the grammar those indian learners of arabic and uh, the bihari learners of telugu were following so uh, when we take up spoken languages we can enumerate the list you know enumerate uh, 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 the uh, the essential utterances and their audio uh, uh, substance otherwise you know how are they supposed to be said the melody pattern they are essential so now when i was you know uh, i was actually uh, i also uh, uh, picked up arabic and uh, i uh, i also can speak uh, very good arabic and uh, uh, when my wife asked me to teach her uh, i didn't know reading and writing arabic but i could speak and that time uh, i was doing this exercise you know i started listing out the number of utterances that i know in arabic and i was uh, really shocked by the end of uh, the entire listing you know i was able to use only uh, 75 to 80 uh, utterances libyan uh, arabic expressions and with that you know people were impressed you know the native speakers of arabic uh could uh, uh, appreciate my arabic and uh, uh, all said and done it was uh it was around 
75 to 80 expressions. Then I started uh, recording my own conversations uh, in my own mother tongue. You know, I, I engaged in my mother tongue. And then uh, I have ended up in my mother tongue. I operate only with 135 to 50 expressions. So if I know 150 expressions, I am a native speaker of Telugu. And if I know 100, and, uh, let us say 200 expressions, definitely I can be very good in my mother tongue. If I know 75 to 80 expressions, I, I was doing well in the marketplace, wherever I go, in my public uh, life with the Arabic community, Arab community. So dear friends, what we need to understand here is when we focus on spoken English, we can focus on 150 to 200 utterances. We can pick them up and grade them up. And for each and every utterance, we need to work out the melody pattern. And then we have to address if there are any extra syllabification, uh, ex, uh, if there is any extra syllabification, if there are any syllable deletions, because syllable deletions, if you delete one syllable, that is what Panini says, you know, the whole utterance will be uh, uh, without sense, will lose its sense. So syllable deletions should not be uh, allowed. Extra syllabification should not be allowed. You know, uh, one of the problems with the Telugu speakers, they add U in the final uh, word formation and then uh, in the in the final uh, uh, in, uh, or in the finality of a word, in the final position of a word, they add U and then that creates an extra syllable and that extra syllabification uh, 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 spoils uh, the meaning of the sentence in the global context. You know, we are talking about uh, 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 mutual intelligibility in the global context. So, and the other important thing is learning, listening to imitate. You know, Sam was listening very carefully and uh, trying to imitate. Listen, listening, uh, uh, you know, learning, listening to imitate. The other important thing is activating speech apparatus. See, whatever the language, the human speech apparatus, its structure is the same across the human languages. So speech apparatus need to be activated. So, uh, and you know, we need to list out 150 to 200 utterances, and we need to work out the melody patterns. And here, audio lingual method is you know uh, uh, very much useful very effective listen and repeat listen and repeat so dear friends what we need to understand is we have to work uh, on Jera, just sorry to interrupt yeah i'm we have concluding right left for uh, questions yes question and answers yes i'm concluding i'm yes. concluding yeah uh, uh, right so we need to look at the native speakers, you know, uh, 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 as a native speaker, we work with 150 to 200 utterances, and we need to pay attention on melody patterns. We need to take care of extra syllabification. We need to take care of syllable reduction or deletions, and we need to pay much attention on listening, uh, right? particularly listening to produce or imitate. And the other important aspect is syllable quality is also very, very important. That is what Panini uh, has clearly mentioned. And Smith and Nelson, they also talk about uh, uh, utterance and utterance quality. In other words, languageness. <coughs> languageness, every language has got its own quality. For example, if we take up Indian languages, plosives are more, uh, uh, then the plosive effect can be seen in the Indian languages, particularly if you look at South Indian languages. If you take up Arabic, they have a lot of gutturals. That is languages. You know, even though I make 100 mistakes, grammatical mistakes, 
they can negotiate with those grammatical mistakes and they can comprehend and interpret what I say. So here, what matters is the languageness is very, very important. And uh, languageness can be uh, acquired or achieved following the audiolingual method. Listen and repeat, listen and repeat, focusing on the context and the purpose, syllables and melody patterns, and then meaning and message. Thank you very much. Hope uh, in the discussion, in, in, in the Q&A, we can uh, 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 share some more ideas. Thank you, Dr. Jairaj. Uh, there are so many questions, of course, of overwhelmed questions. Uh, what we do is we try to uh, pick a few important questions and uh, we do the uh, query. We, we follow the query session. There is one question from uh, uh, Ms. Lakshmi. Uh, the question follows like this. Does phonetics, the study of phonetics, it depends on the current environment a learning environment with respect to the Indian classroom setting and as per demographic data. Can I can I repeat the question again? Yeah, please. Does study of phonetics depends on current environment or learning environment with respect to the Indian classroom setting and as per demographic data? See, actually, uh... Uh, you know, to be specific, why do we teach English at all? For me to live in India, I don't need English at all. If I pick up some Hindi and my mother tongue, uh, you know, I'm all, uh, I'm, uh, I have my own mother tongue and I pick up uh, some Hindi and I can move uh, uh, across India. I can live here. I don't need English at all. Why do I need English at all? But, you know, we, you know, uh, try to pick up English for global purposes. When we go global, you know, uh, uh, we can always, you know, uh, we can always, we can always, you know, try to be intelligible. And to make our students intelligible globally, I think, you know, our classroom should address certain issues. You know, uh, you know, when... MTI, mother tongue influence, is licensed. You know, there are two principles, actually. Uh, I, I'm an English teacher. I go to the classroom. It's quite liberal. I allow my learners L1 experience uh, into the classroom. Then they come up with some local variety of English. The other principle is, I'm an English teacher. I don't allow L1 experience of the learners. So, only English, and they end up with some near native variety. So this is where we need to pay attention on the classroom, the classroom environment uh, 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 need to be exploited even for the globally intelligible variety. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, we are running short of time. Uh, so what we can do is we will try to mail you the other questions so that I think you can uh, directly answer those questions to the participants. And uh, this is the time for uh, uh, saying thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Jairaj, for your talk. A very enriching and uh, inspiring talk on approaching spoken English uh, a phonetician's rumination and it is of course very interesting with uh, practical examples of utterances on uh, pronunciation uh, in fact uh, we were really uh, you know enlightened with your talk uh, i also thank uh, the eltai for conducting this webinars and uh, the backend team who played a very crucial role in you know, in, in smooth functioning of, of the webinar. And I fin finally thank the participants for making this 89th webinar as successful by participating. Thank you, one and all.
Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Thank you, Dr. Jairaj. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, uh, dear participants, uh, the next week's webinar is titled Human Centered Design to Problem Solving. Uh, the resource person of this session will be uh, Ms. Mega Junja, Training and Model Implementation Manager, Purdue Polytechnic High School, uh, Indianapolis, USA. Uh, this session will be moderated by uh, Dr. Ashok Gunji, Assistant Professor, MIT ADT University, Pune. I request the participants to register for this event as well. Thank you so much. We come to end of the session.